1964, when I moved to London with a band called The Fairies, we were very unfairy like actually, but um, we were called, we were sort of a hard nosed R and B band. Anyway, we moved to London um, and we, we were very popular. We had a single out um, called Don't Think Twice, It's Alright. In fact, we were the first that was a big hit, yeah. electric band to record um, a Dylan song. Yeah, that's a big so, hit for you guys. And we had a big following in Scotland. We toured Scotland um, quite, quite often. We kept getting called back there. And we had a fan base there and a fan club. Mm -hmm. The fans used to send knickknacks down to the uh, the flat where we lived in London, which we all shared together. Okay. And in the knickknack box was Twink Homepun, oh, which, which was which was for me because you had the hair because I had like very long, long yeah. you know, it was just a little you know little joke you know. Right. Anyway, the guys in the band when we meet people say, "Well, this is this is Twink," but the guys started to introduce me as Twink to people. And they kind of stuck, the name stuck. And I tried to get rid of it many times uh, in the early days, but I gave up and I used the name. When you were a child, your father was a concert pianist. No, my, my grandmother was a concert pianist. Concert, okay, grandmother was a concert pianist. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, so you're exposed to classical music back then. Um, not not terribly because I never really heard a lot of classical music in my early days. My father was a huge uh, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby fan, right? Crooners, so, yeah, the crooners. So he got me in to music that that way, if you like. Um, and he was interested in all the big bands. He was a great. You know, he used to go and see all the big bands in London. Right. Um, you know, Camp Basie, uh, yeah, yeah, Camp Basie, but some of the smaller bands as well, Loose, Loose Stone Band, hmm. um, you know, uh, UK bands obviously were more popular in Britain yeah, at that, time, that right? time, yeah. But then when rock and roll came along, it was like, wow, this is it, this is for me, yeah. yeah. So you were what, like what, oh, 10 or 11, something yeah, like something that? Yeah, something around you started about, to play drums? You, well, no, I, I started to play guitar. Oh, you started on guitar? I started on guitar. Um, and as I, then I moved to drums um, and became known, as, became known as a drummer very, very fast locally. Uh, and I got work. Was it because you preferred the drums? Or, no, or? I, I handed the guitar because I was in a skiffle group. The skiffle group was called the Airliners because we were all air scouts. Oh, okay. uh, so we had a skiffle group in the, um, you know, uh, in the club, if you like, as, um, Called, and we called ourselves the airliners. We did actually do shows and stuff like that. And, um, and I was playing guitar. But then this guy came along who was absolutely brilliant on guitar and much better than me. So I gave him my guitar and mm -hmm. I switched the washboard. Oh, so, that's, okay. so I got into percussion that way. Then after the, the washboard, um, I bought some drums. Like a proper set of drums. A proper set of drums, you know. But the 60s, W was a golden a golden age. Mm -hmm. Look, just looking at that block period, you know, it's a golden. How age. would you describe it to the young people that are watching right now? I don't think. What I were think the sixties like? I don't. I, I don't know. In, in living in London, I mean, it was just um, the camaraderie of all all the people, which which actually, when you got into it, it kind of like you know you reached out to everyone in the UK. You know, all the other musicians right. and all the other fans. And then there was this communication, like almost telepathically with people in America, you know, with like the West Coast kind of... Um, Mind uh, frame, mindset. Mindset, but, but the music, it was all in the music, you know, the Jefferson Aeroplane, um, the Doors. California. Uh, yeah, yeah, California, really. It was like, and there was... Suddenly, I was just listening to American music, that that type of music. It's, it's sort of, and then, you know, people were just. It was just a wonderful feeling worldwide. It was just, you know, and the Beatles were uh, cementing everything together as well. You know, with their with what they were doing. You know, it was. A, Do you have a cool Beatles story? In nineteen sixty six, I think it was nineteen sixty six, maybe sixty five. I think it was sixty six. Um. The birds, the American birds, right. were booked to play in the, my local club in um, um, in London, mm -hmm. South Kensington. It was a club called Blazers, and of course I wanted to see them because I'd already listened to their albums and I thought they were great. Yeah. And um, 
So anyway, I got to the club quite late. The place was packed. And I went in there, you know, trying to get through the crowd. And I looked across the hallway, or I looked across the floor way, and a mutual friend, um, a guy called Steve O'Rourke, who was, he later became the Pink Floyd's manager, you know. Oh, he, wow. He's yeah. no longer with us, unfortunately, a lovely guy. He was standing up, he was going, twink, you know, calling me over. So I said, oh, great, I've got somewhere to sit down, because we were having to, <laughs> I had a table. And um, as I kind of like walked into I said, oh my God, it's John Lennon. Was sitting at the was at the table. Oh my goodness! With with, with Cynthia, um, and George Harrison with Patty Boyd. Hmm. Phil May of the Pretty Things, the singer for the Pretty Things, was there, and of course Steve O'Rourke, and George, and 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 uh, Patty were moving up over like this to make room for me. Right. So I got to the table. I sat down and uh, watched the the birds perform. You know, with with the Beatles. You know, oh. it was amazing. John That's was a bit sarcastic at the at the end of the uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the set. He, he got up and he sort of threw. I did the thing much of that, and, and, oh, and, yeah. and he left. And and George was a little bit more subtle. He said, um, "Wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that was a, that was terrific. You know, spending some time with them. You know. But you're talking about how how unified the scene was. You were in groups that existed for a matter of months like for example in t tomorrow tomorrow was becoming very very successful mm -hmm. um we were kind of the, the darlings if you like of the of the london underground scene and we, we we were playing regularly at the ufo club we played all the uh the major festivals um you know alongside pink floyd um the crazy world of arthur brown um, oh, soft yeah. machine Jimi Hendrix experience, um, but there was a lot going on be behind the scenes which the band wasn't aware of. The singer had a solo record which went to number two in the charts. It was very successful. It was called um, uh, Excerpt from a Teenage Opera, Grocer Jack. It was a huge hit worldwide. I seem to recall. Yeah. You know, it's got grosser Jack, grosser <laughs> Jack, get off your back, go into town, don't let them down. Oh no, no. And there's this huge kids chorus in the background. Right. Um, anyway, um, now we had a meeting as a group before the record came out. And I put forward the idea that we should promote the band at the same time as promoting Keith's. Um, Single. Single. So, so instead of it being Keith West, we agree that the single should be released as Keith Tomorrow. Steve Howe was planning a record with, with, the, with our producer. Our producer was at the meeting. As Steve Tomorrow, Junior, the bass player, would have a record as Junior Tomorrow, and, I, and I have a, I'd have a record as to Twink Tomorrow. We'd all have our own little records. Oh. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, it was a good idea. Well, you know, Kiss did it a few years later where they all released solo albums or singles at the same yeah. time and they whoop, all went up the charts. It could have worked. But anyway, when the single came out, it came out as Keith West. Mm. So whoop, it went up the charts. And of course, Keith was away. And then he had all these like kind of business, <coughs> business people saying, well, Go solo, mate. You're going to make a lot of money now. You know, right. you're breaking yeah. up, leave, leave the band. So all that was going on. You know, I mean, I understand he was in a very difficult position, but he could have been a bit more loyal. I worked. I, I played with Ron Roddy in three different bands. I played with him right. while I was with the Fairies. I went, used to go and see his band, The Birds, performing at the 100 Club. Just what, the British Birds. The British Birds, yeah. Right. One evening, his, his drummer um, had sprained his ankle. So I was called in to help them out and, right. and sit in with them. So I played with Ron Wood in, the, in that lineup. That was, I think, 65. He's actually published his diaries recently from that period. And he's got in there, twink came up and joined us on stage, you know. Oh. And then in 67, 
Um, I got a call from Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart phoned me up and he said, Twink, um, can you come down to the Jeff Beck group rehearsals? Because Mickey Waller hasn't showed up. Mickey Waller was the, the drummer. Right. For the Jeff Beck group. So I said, sure. So I went down there. Ron was on bass, actually. Um, Jeff Beck was on lead guitar. Rod Stewart on vocals and me on drums for the rehearsals. You know, just, out, just sitting and helping them out. You know. Just not a bad band. <coughs> not, not a bad band. band. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was great fun. Um, and a couple of months later, because I was sharing a flat with John Lord. He was the um, keyboard player. Keyboardist for Deep Purple. Deep Purple. Yeah. I shared a flat with him. Um, and he was trying to organize a new band because the band that he was with was called the Art Woods and you know he wanted to, he wanted to they weren't doing very well at that time mm -hmm. and he was uh, trying to organize <clears throat> a new band so he invited me into the recording studio with um, Ron Wood on lead guitar Kim Gardner uh, from Ashton Gardner and Dyke um, on bass John Lord on keyboards and me on drums, and we we recorded three tracks, which mm. came out on a, came out on a, an, an immediate blues anytime volume three compilation. But the thing was, Jeff Beck, um, well, um, Ron Wood was actually playing with Jeff Beck at the time. John Lord, as you know, was was trying to form Deep Purple. Um, I was already doing very well with Tomorrow, so there really wasn't and the opportunity to, you know, for us to go forward as a band. Right. You know, um, just, so when the record came out, uh, you know, the three tracks were released, <coughs> we were released as a, we were called the Santa Barbara Machine Head. Uh, very nice tracks actually, yeah. And, you know, quite popular. Oh yeah, that's three, the three bands that I, yeah. that I played with Ron Bruce. And we're still mates, we still, we're still pals, you know, we still talk. He was looking to form a band in England, Iggy Pop. Oh, okay. Um, and David Bowie suggested myself as his drummer to Iggy. Oh, for Iggy, wow. And um, another guy who, who David knew, a guy called Honk, to play bass. So he put those names forward. Right. So, and he said, phone Iggy, David, David said, phone Iggy at the Royal Garden Hotel. Um, and you know, See what happens. Yeah. So yeah. I called him up, and um, I'd already, I'd already met him. Yeah, I'd already met him at that time. But anyway, I said, "Hey, it's Twink." David said to give you a ring because you're looking for a drummer. He says, "Well, Twink," he said, "I've decided to go back to America and form a band mm. in America, so I'm leaving the UK." And oh. so. I think he went back and formed, reformed the Stooges when he got back. We promised we were going to talk about Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, well, as, as I said earlier, one of my favorite people, one of the nicest um, people that, that I ever met, you know, mm. very, very kind. But yeah, I played with, uh, played with Jimi Hendrix twice. Um, shall I tell you about that? Yes, please. <laughs> the, fir the first yeah. time, um, tomorrow, we're, we're playing at the UFO Club. And that was our first date there first booking and what happened we, we were very lucky to be there because um there was a band called the smoke i think that smoke were booked to appear there but then they they pulled out mm. so the booking agent um put us forward and the guy that ran a, a guy called joe boyd american and said Wasn't okay he a record producer he was a record producer for, for electra well, he, and, he produced everybody yeah he did yeah, he was a great guy you know his favorite band is Limited tomorrow Thompson. Tomorrow. Ah, oh, that's right. Band. I read that. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, well, allegedly, <laughs> um, he, but he does say that uh, he's put that on record. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so okay, so we we were performing, and, and a, a mutual friend, um, a guy called Howard Parker, um, uh, he's no longer with us, um, unfortunately. But um, anyway, he was a friend of the Tomorrow Band. He was showing Jimi Hendrix around London. Um, and he brought Jimmy down to see the band because he knew he'd like, he would like us. Okay. So anyway, we're playing, blah, 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 and Jimi Hendrix walks in with H. We were seeing, we'd see people coming in, you know, and moving through the crackers. Most people were sitting on the floor watching. Right. Um, so Jimmy's coming through the crowd and he sits down on the floor. 
with H's and watching us. And our bass player would often put his bass down on, turn it up on feedback, leaving Steve Howe and myself to sort of jam away. Um, and, um, and, he'd, and he'd do some like mime, some audience participation stuff, you know. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it really, it really did work, you know, Me mesmerize people, you know. Um, so Jimmy just stood up, came onto the stage, flipped over the bass, because it was a right-handed bass, just flipped it and fell, and started jamming with us. Oh my goodness. It was amazing. We jammed for about 20 minutes, but it was, it was, it was something very special. Oh, for sure. You know, absolutely. And in fact, Jimmy, Jimmy was um, we're about, about the same distance um, away from you that you are, sitting on the floor in front of the amp. Steve Howe was just over here. And Jimmy was sitting on the floor at the end of the, uh, the, the sort of jam. He looked up and he went, Twink, is this love? <laughs> 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 Which is great, you know, a great thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> it was you, great. Now, well, moving on to the pretty things um mm -hmm. you know i mean when you did when the band did sf sorrow mm -hmm. were you and you filled in for a, a, a skip a, allen yeah skip well yeah. they'd already started recording sf Sorrow. Right. skip had already recorded three tracks and i came in to finish the album for, for them. now back then were you aware that you were recording something that would go on to be such a a classic you know, I mean, it was, really, like, it was like the really. first concept album, right? Well, it, well, it actually uh, it wasn't Essential. the first one, but it was, it was a, a year before Tommy was released. Um, right. So sorry it came out. But there, there are other, um, other concept albums in the, in the rock field which really you know, were the first. Okay, so yeah, so you know, we're in amongst the first. In amongst, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's did you did, did you guys listen to it and just go, man, this is really great. This is something. Not else. really, yeah. not, not really. I mean, we 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 obviously put the effort in to make something great, right. and I I I I did kind of feel it had something very special to offer, um, but you know, you move on. I mean, I, I recorded a thing, Pink, when, when SF Sorrow, we finished recording SF Sorrow, I went straight into the studio and recorded Thing Pink. So like two classic back-to-back -back records. Yeah. Because, I mean, your Think Pink was... Yeah, it's getting I mean, more, that's getting more recognition as time goes on. Often thought that Sid Barrett got a raw deal oh, you, you from know, Pink Floyd. Absolutely right. Uh, doing some talks the truth about stars because nobody nobody knows the truth well everybody came on and said sid took a trip pcp whatever he was gone and yet he did them he did barrett he did madcap laughs exactly. he did stars yeah he, he was brilliant well, he, at star. came, he came out looking when that, I was playing with a band with the last minute put together Boogie Down while I was living in Cambridge. Well, I have the Pink Fairies. I moved to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. When I came back from Morocco, I went to Cambridge. And I joined a band called the last minute put together Boogie Band. <laughs> I love that name. Yeah, that was, that was a, an American guy, actually, was the vocalist, a bright guy called Bruce Payne. Love, lovely guitarist, lovely vocalist. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. But anyway, we... Um, we were doing some great shows, and one evening, we were booked to um, back a, a blues, American blues artist, a guy called Eddie Guitar Burns, at uh, King's College in, in Cambridge. And I'm setting up my drums. The side door opens, and Sid walks in with his uh, guitar case in hand. Oh, wow. With his guitar. What's so, well, Sid doing here? <laughs> You know, and he was with Jenny, Jenny Spires, who was married to Jack Monk, who was the bass player. Mm -hmm. um, but he, she had been a friend, a, a girlfriend of Sid's before. But anyway, because right. okay. she was kind of... Anyway, I didn't know at the time, but she brought him along because he was looking for musicians to play with. So I guess, I guess me and Jack were being auditioned. Yeah. Oh, so, sure. So anyway, so we jammed. We jammed. You know, he, he asked us, can, you know, can we jam? Can I? So we said, yeah, of course you can. Two nights later, we were booked to support the Pink Fairies and Hawkwind at Cambridge Corn Exchange. 
And we were setting up again, and the same thing happened. Sid, Sid turns up with your guitar, the cut, you know, guitar case and guitar. Can I jam with you guys again? So we said, yeah, why not? So anyway, it transpired that Sid was um, thought that Jack and myself were the two best musicians in, in Cambridge. Oh. And, um, you know, he wanted to form a van with us. So that's what happened. A couple of days later, we went around to Sid's house and we all agreed that we would um, put the band together. And so I left, myself and Jack left the last minute to put together Boogie Band. And we formed stars and we started practicing in Sid's, in Sid's um, basement and his mum's house in, in, in uh, Hills Road in Cambridge. But then we moved, we moved to my, my um, where I was living, I was living in a little cottage, um, just around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a back room that we used to, to rehearse in, which was, uh, yeah. He was fun. very competent. Well, oh, you, absolutely. I mean, he so this whole thing about him being uh, fried yeah, or really. whatever, yeah, it's yeah, just, no, he it's was, just bullshit. It, it really, it's complete, complete bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Oh. You know, he, he was no stranger than anyone else around at the time. You know, no stranger than me, no stranger than Jack, no, you know. Yeah. Apparently they're saying that uh, during the recording of Wish You Were Here, which is about Sid, he walked in. Yeah. You know, do you know if that's true? I, you know what? I don't know if it's true, but I don't believe it. For that, for the guys in the band to say they didn't recognize him as well. So that he's sitting there and his old bandmates say they didn't recognize him. Yeah. Come on. George Martin is very special. Did you get to work with George Martin? Never worked with George Martin. Yeah. Um, I worked with Mark Wirtz, who was a very special producer as well. Right. I worked with Jeff Emmerich, who was the engineer on the Beatles albums. He was the engineer on Sasha Pepper. Um, and I worked with all the engineers at Abbey Road. Because you guys were recording when they were doing Abbey Road, well, yeah. or, or uh, well, well, Sergeant Peppers, right? Well, tomorrow, you see, that's another thing. The Pretty Things put out some um, some blurb, some bullshit, if you like, mm -hmm. saying, well, yeah, as if Sorrow was recorded at the same time as Sergeant Pepper, but that's not true. They didn't sign the, they didn't sign their contract until October 68, no, 67. Sergeant Pepper was out sometime in March. Oh, the same, year. right? But I was in the studio with Tomorrow the same time as as the as the Beatles were recording. In fact, I heard um, for the benefit of Mr. Kite, mm -hmm. I saw John Lennon mixing uh, for the benefit of Mr. Kite one evening uh, um, at Abbey Road. You know, the, before anyone else had heard it. It was kind of a funny story that one because we, myself and Keith Wyatt were sitting outside Studio Two, which was the Beatles favorite studio and we're just sitting there saying, what's going on in there because we knew they were in there you know <laughs> doing something you know, like this and then Ringo comes bounding down the hallway you know there's a couple of them evening lads he says to us and we go oh uh, hi he opens the door and John Lennon's sitting there you know and he's like kaftan you know the um the Maharishi type kaftan right thing. yeah he's, he's well, like he turned around like his head's closed and gave us a nod and it was just amazing Music, you know, it's coming through, coming through the speakers. There's no retirement for you on the horizon, right? Well, actually, I retired uh, about 10 years ago to Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, I bought a house there, and while I was in my house, I thought, I think I'd like to remarry because I was I was then you know divorced and uh, so I started looking for a wife and I, I met um, I met a Moroccan lady who uh, I quite liked and you know and now you got a, family, a small family and I've got a little family I got a uh, well we were, I asked her to marry me and she said yes which I was thrilled about and a couple of years later my daughter came along Sarah who's absolutely wow. beautiful and gorgeous and full of life and so with the appearance of my daughter 
I need to, to, to get out there and um, make some money it's because she need because she need she needs stuff, you know. Yeah, that's she needs it? clothes and she needs books for school and she needs and we and she's at a private school in in Morocco because the actual um, public schools are pretty, you know, not not at all good. Right. Um, so. You know, so there you go. I'm out of retirement now. As, as long as as long as you can remain creative. Yeah, exactly. That's, Why retire? I think that's it. Exactly. You're yeah. absolutely right. You know, cre- that's it. You know, I mean, you've got the Rolling Stones. They're still playing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, you watch Mick Jagger like what a month after heart surgery, yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. out there. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> that's pretty. Yeah, cool. no, it's pretty great. And Paul McCartney, every time you look at the media, it's like he's just done something here, he's doing something yeah. there, he's recorded a new album there, he's amazing. It's phenomenal. You know? Yeah, just keeping and up. Jo- um, not George, no, God bless him, he's a lot. Ringo. Ringo is still out there doing stuff, you know. Yeah, the all star band and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. John, can I have a hug? Sure, you can. <laughs> Great pleasure talking to you. I came up with The Madcap Laughs by Sid Barrett, one of my uh, I, my favorite album, I think, of all time. It's such a, a magic um, recording. Um, I, it, it, it brings back memories of the time that I was uh, spending in London at that time. Uh, I used to get home late, late yeah, in the in the well early morning, and that would be what I put on, you know, just before I'd uh, crash out. You know, it's lo- lovely album, really, really great. Number two, Revolver, uh, classic Beatles, at the uh, the top of their game, um, and they just recently discovered. Um, I mean, all four of them. I know M- McCartney was was uh, already well into LSD. Um, but I think all of them, by the time they started recording Revolver, um, you know, that was, uh, they were all, were all at it. The next one, Sketches of Spain, absolutely beautiful recording by Miles Davis. Number four, Days of Future Past, another album, a little bit before um, crashing out to uh, the Madcap Laughs, I'd get home and I'd play Days of Future Past, I'd put that on the turntable mm-hmm. and... Uh, just drift off into sleep. And I had too, too much to dream last night. When I discovered the electric prunes, um, they just blew me away. They're the psychedelic sounds, the guitar sounds, and um, amazing. L- love it so much. <laughs> 